Artemis is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III. And you've made it to your on your way to the weekend edition of the Hamilton Corner program. Most of you are making that transition from your part time jobs where you generate an income for your families to your full time jobs, which I describe as your duty to discharge faithfulness to our Lord and King. But doing so through a primary context with this, which is through serving our families well, it is far uh, too common in our day and our time for people to neglect their homes in an effort to be faithful in all manner of other areas, you know, whether it be through employment circumstances or whether or not you're a business owner or whether or not it's through hobbies. And and nowadays you even have a proliferation of young adults that are kind of hooked on gaming. (laughs) Uh, My encouragement to you is to make sure that we are not, we are serving our families well. We are resisting the trend of the world to neglect the home and to elevate everything beyond the home. And I also want to say, because I know there are a significant amount of home-based disciplers, (laughs) uh, domestic engineers, whatever you want to call yourselves, homemakers. I just want to encourage you, uh, mothers and wives, to let you know that what you are doing is ministry. You're, you're, You're not a placeholder. You're not a babysitter. You are engaged in ministry. The ministry that you are engaged in there, discipling within your home is just as robust, is just as plenteous, is just as uh, is just as as uh, commendable uh, as other areas of ministry. Sometimes we have this tendency to compare ourselves amongst ourselves. You know, some people have a higher estimation for foreign missions than they do for domestic missions. And what I want to encourage us all to understand is that God has fit us together in his body as he wills, as he wills. Uh, You didn't determine what gifts you would have. You didn't determine what abilities you'd have. You didn't determine your own calling. God has done that. And so it is incumbent upon us to understand that as members of the body, the eye can't say to the tongue, where's your sense of seeing? You know, as the Apostle Paul uh, said, the the, the, uh, fingers can't say to the heart, where's your sense of touch? When we understand that we each have a role and an assignment to fulfill within the family of God, it allows us to thrive in what God has called us to do while simultaneously being able to celebrate God and encourage our brethren and sister in in functioning in the capacity that God has given them. There are no giving them. There are no big eyes to literally use in the family of God. We all have our role to play. And as we fill our lanes, God is glorified. And by his grace, his eternal family is expanded and increased. Praise God for that. Today, we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter five. But let me say this. Uh, when we proceed to the second and third segments of the program, uh, I'm just going to want to offer this disclaimer now. I'll do it again later on, hopefully, uh, in, in the program. Um, we're going to be delving into some serious topics, some sensitive topics uh, concerning gender and sexuality and identity. And if you Uh, have young ones that you'd rather them not be a part of this conversation at this time, I want to encourage you to go ahead and exercise uh, your your judiciousness because you know what's best for your family. You know what's best for your children. And I do not want to intrude upon your province as parents and shepherds of your family. uh, So you decide whether or not you want them to participate in this conversation uh, because we're going, we're not, we're not, not going to be graphic or gory concerning sexuality uh, but we are going to address these topics so if you would rather uh, determine when you broach these topics of conversation with your children with your young ones uh, please uh, heed this disclaimer and be be forewarned that from the second segment on uh, uh, with the guests that we've invited onto the program today uh, we're going to attack these issues from a biblical standpoint and share some personal testimony and things of that nature okay all right Today we're going to start because it is our, uh, what we do here is we frame every program, every show that we do, we begin 
with the word of God first. The reason why we do that is before we attempt to navigate the issues, it is incumbent, it is important, it is absolutely necessary that we approach them through the lens of scripture. There's so much that's happening today where it's, it's really cult cultural eisegesis that we see the trends and things that are happening in culture. And then many people want to impose upon scripture what the dictates of culture are. When the reality is we should do this in the reverse. We should see what the scripture says, exegesis, exegete the text, see what the word of God says, draw from the text what God conveyed, and then apply that grid or lens to what's happening in the culture and find our place and navigate culture based on the anchor that is the word of God. And so we endeavor to do that here on the program. In Ephesians chapter 5, uh, this is the epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote to the saints in Ephesus. In Ephesus, modern day, a city in modern day, Turkey. And we're going to go through verses 1 through 11. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We're going to read through it, then make some observations from the text as we go forward. Here we go. Verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks for this, you know, with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons or the children of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. Now, you see, right at the beginning of verse one, hmm, you see the Apostle Paul say, therefore, in light of the everything that precedes chapter five, verse one. So the preceding four chapters, Paul then says there in light of all of the things that we've discussed up to this point, we followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Specifically, Paul was addressing the believers in Ephesus at that time, which apply by extension to all believers. Therefore, in light of the previous four chapters, be imitators of God as beloved children. I love this phrase because you have uh, two components in that, that first, that verse there. You have one, our responsibility to be imitators of God. You know, we are teaching our children in our local assembly. We're teaching them, of course, in logic. And we have described um, logic as thinking that is consistent with the mind of God. What is illogical thinking? Anything that is inconsistent with the mind of God. We also describe it in terms of thinking God's thoughts after him. We are to be imitators of God. My, my, uh, my wife, even when she was teaching the children, she put up a slide that showed, you know, um, a, a, a father uh, with their shadow. Uh, when the shadow is not the father, but the shadow is, is kind of an, an, a similitude to the father. And when she did that, she described that our, as we endeavor to worship God with our minds, is that we desire for our minds and as a result of our minds, our lifestyles to be a shadow of what God is, of who God is, so that our lifestyles reflect, one, the relationship we have with God, but two, a consistency with who God is. And so we describe now, will the shadow ever become the father? No. Will we ever become God? Absolutely not. That's one of the most ludicrous statements you could ever imagine. But we nevertheless have been compelled instructed and commissioned to be imitators of God. Then the latter part of verse one gives the relational context for this imitation, just like a father and the son be imitators of God. How as beloved children. So you have this, this, 
this posture to think God's thoughts after him, to be imitators of God. But then you have this relational context to where we are in the family. And that is the context for us being imitators of God. And then in verse two, it goes on to say, and walk in love. The believer's life must be characterized by the love of God, not just love for God, but characterized by the love of God. Our lives being characterized by the love of God includes absolutely our passionate, persistent and consistent love for God. But it also includes because the love of God is more more expansive than just our love for God. It also includes the love we should have for mankind. The love we should have for our fellow men, for our fellow man, the love that we have, which automatically comes with it, a healthy dose of compassion. Now, when you see and understand that we're talking about the love of God, not a soupy, misconstrued, a Hollywood based romantic comedy version of what they describe as L-O-V-E, because I contend that that is not love at all. When you understand the love of God, 1 Corinthians 13 gives us a nice description as to what that love looks like in practice, what that love looks like in application. The love of God, which results in our love for fellow mankind, is not synonymous with a, with a, ta- with a, with a milk toast, passive acceptance to everything that people want to do. As the Spirit of God communicated through the apostle Paul that the love of God doesn't rejoice in deception, but rejoices in truth. And so this brings us back to the conversation we've been having all week about being filled with both grace and truth. It's not, you know, the Hollywood romantic comedy version of their description of the word L O V E, but it is the love of God, which results, which includes love for God and love for our fellow man. And then verse two gives us an example and we are to walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Brothers and sisters, the reality is that the love of God that our lives should be characterized by includes a sacrificial love. You know, one of the greatest opportunities that we get to exercise this type of love is within our marital relationships. In the same chapter, The spirit of God communicates through the apostle Paul that husbands are to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. The same type of of sacrifice is employed in evangelistic endeavors and in disciple making. We often have to uh, adjust our schedules and and forego uh, certain delicacies and and forego certain entertainment opportunities so that we can be poured out like drink offerings in service to the Lord's purposes in our time. This is what it's talking about, about the love for God and the love that we are to walk in. Man, this clock is disrespectful. (laughs) Then verses three. Let me try to get through these verses three and four. Verse three says, but immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks for this, you know, with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Folks, this is real talk coming from the scripture right here. The reason why we engage in the manner that we engage in, and I'm going to tie this into a verse at the very end, um, is because we know in, in where it says in verse 5, immorality is literally talking about sexual immorality. And you notice that immorality and impurity and filthiness is connected even to coarse jesting. Because we know the scripture says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when we have our, our, our mouths filled with crude jesting, it's an overflow from the heart. Then verse 11 goes on to say, and do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. Why? It goes back to what's said in verses five and six. Because you know with certainty, immoral, impure, and covetous. Idolatrous people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we are to let no one deceive us with empty words because it it is because of this, as it says in verse six, that the wrath of God, the wrath of God is poured out on the sons of disobedience. We love in this manner because we love people so much, we care more about the eternity 
than we do about their temporal existence. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You have better things to do. What's one vote in the grand scheme of things? It's just one. So why bother? After all, who cares about the future of American families? Who cares about my education? Who cares about religious freedom? Who cares about the life of the unborn? Who cares about the world you're leaving your children? I do. I do. I care. I care. Voting is a privilege that I take seriously. If every Christian would register and then actually vote. We could flood Washington with men and women who actually care about our values, beliefs, and convictions. We could restore America back to her moral foundation. But you know what? Don't worry about it. It's just my future. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I, uh, man, I am, I am, I'm sobered, I'm excited, I'm, I'm ecstatic to have on the program with me uh, a man who, who I have admired uh, from a distance for quite a long time, one who I've also had the privilege of, of being in uh, American Family Association's upcoming uh, documentary film in his image that will be released this fall. Uh, my guest for the program today is a dear brother in Christ, Walt Heyer. Mr. Heyer, thank you so much for joining me on the program here today. Yeah, thank you so much. What a pleasure to be on and talk about the movie. That's uh, it's an important movie for everyone to see. Yeah, it it, it absolutely is and uh he's referring to of course uh in his image the website for the movie is in his image dot movie uh embracing god's design for identity and sexuality and this is something that is uh close to my heart of course and close to your heart heart walt uh based on your experience the journey uh that the lord has brought you through would you share with the listeners a little bit of your testimony and then we'll build up to uh your participation in this film Sure. Um, you know, my <clears throat> my journey starts in started in 1944. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I'm 79 years old. So uh, we're we're more than 75 years of uh, personal experience. Um, I've done research on this. I detransitioned, and uh, so this has been my life really since 1944. And so I've uh, built quite a um, cachet of information about it. So what what happens uh, when my grandmother started cross-dressing me, and it, I'm sure I encouraged her to do so or certainly didn't discourage her, but when she started cross-dressing me um, in, in, at the age of four, what we're really doing to a young boy without really realizing it, and that, that's why it's important to be able to look back and and look at the consequences was that she was actually putting me in a purple chiffon dress and telling me how cute I was Mm -hmm. as a girl. The problem with that is that what you're saying is to that young child is that there was something wrong with me as a boy, that Mm -hmm. somehow I needed to be in a dress uh, that she could affirm me in a dress, how cute I was in a dress, but not so cute in cowboy boots and tore up blue jeans. So uh, we we see what happens to a developing child who's trying to gain his footing about who he is. And Mm -hmm. so by her doing that, uh, she caused uh, this brokenness uh, about who I was and how I was going to be accepted in this new world as I'm four years old. So uh, she was babysitting me when my parents would go away probably every other weekend. And so she began to implant these ideas, this confusion um, into my head. And we didn't have any terminology for it. You know, um, nobody knew what a transgender was back then. Nobody had any other terms. It was just a grandma dressing up a boy in a dress. 
And mm -hmm. we now see the consequences 75 plus years later. So mm -hmm. for, for two and a half years, Grandma said, this is our little secret. And so we kept it from my parents so nobody knew. So during this time, she's really uh, molding and shaping my thinking about who I was. And I became somewhat discouraged about being a boy just by the fact mm -hmm. that I wasn't being affirmed as a boy. I wasn't being told how handsome I was or how cute I was or how bright I was. It was this thing with the purple dress. So the purple dress became a symbol um, uh, of something new in my life that I should be adopting. So when, I, mm -hmm. when my parents found out, of course, um, they were terribly upset. And the purple dress went away. I wasn't able to go to grandma's. She wasn't able to babysit me anymore. But what we what we need to know, the listener to this today needs to know, is the damage is done. And mm -hmm. so, how, you know, we're in 1944. There's no Internet. There's nobody talking about these issues. So how does, a uh, at this time, a six-and-a-half-year-old child deal with grandma cross-dressing him and then now not seeing grandma knowing that my parents are upset about it? So you have all these things going on. And then the the most important thing I believe is that <clears throat> at at about age seven or eight, I don't can't lock it down specifically, but uh, because of the purple dress, uh, there was a teenage uncle, my dad's adopted brother, who decided that I was fair game to be uh, taunted, teased, uh, touched inappropriately, and molested. Mm -hmm. So now we have, you know, Grandma who put me in a purple dress. Now we have an uncle who's inappropriately um, dealing with me in, in these sort of the sexualization thing, uh, mm -hmm. which was very confusing to a seven, eight, nine-year-old child. So, and did you say the uncle, he, your he, uncle, knew about the purple dress? Yeah, that's why he, mm -hmm. you know, he found out about it. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody probably whispered it to him or who knows, but um, that made me a uh, fair game uh, as far as he was concerned. And so then we, these occurrences happened. So now I'm dealing with these these different elements in my life. So I'm, I'm beginning to have difficulty going to sleep. I'm, um, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of emotion and confusion and disappointment in my life. Well, on one side, and on the other side, thinking about, well, maybe I was born wrong, maybe. So you have this terrible um, confusion uh, about who I was supposed to be. And so these things don't go away easily. And I sort of held them. Um, I, I told my parents that I was sexually molested, but they said, oh, Uncle Fred would never do that. So they they denied that it happened, which left me to realize that I couldn't tell anybody anything because they weren't going to believe me anyway. So I just sort of locked down any of my feelings or thoughts in terms of sharing them. But it was in the early 50s. Um, there was a headline, Christine Jorgensen. First time I saw the, the terminology. By this time, I'm in my uh, early teens, you know, uh, 12, 13, whatever it was. And the term transgender came up, and, had, and this mm. Christine Jorgensen had surgery, was a big deal, was in the military. So that was the first time I saw something. I thought, oh, okay, that must be who I am. So that was my reference point about what had happened to me. This, this must have been me. I'm like Christine Jorgensen. So that was my wow. sort of attachment to this. Mm. So uh, as I went through this and began to develop that thinking um, I struggled, uh, you know, with with who I was. But what's interesting is um, I was never homosexual, and and cross gender identities um, are not about. Uh, and, and the people I work with, ninety percent of them, uh, don't have same sex attraction, and they're not homosexual. So, transgender identities really have oftentimes have little to do with homosexuality or same sex attraction but have everything to do with some form of, of abuse. And, and so what grandma did was abuse. It was psychological and emotional abuse. What Uncle Fred did was sexual abuse. So you have these 
three very important components to childhood development that happened before I was 10 years old. So I was abused. That's amazing. But nobody's dealing with abuse, and and certainly not me, because I didn't recognize that was the issue. So uh, I had girlfriends. Um, I grew up. I ran track. I was a kicker on the football team. Um, mm-hmm. on, on one side, if you looked at me, I was all boy. I had good-looking girlfriends. I went on dates in high school. I got married um, and had two children. Um, I worked on the Apollo space missions. Um, yeah, I eventually you, you, went you, to work. I was going to say you secured huh? a pretty, pretty. You secured a pretty. Um, many people would 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 identify it as a pretty amazing job, having a wife, having children. All of these things happened even after the abuse you suffered as a child, right? Yeah, well, you know, that's actually fairly normal. Uh, mm-hmm. Many of the, the men that I work with who are struggling with this are married with one, two, three, or four kids, um, and they're not homosexual. Um, and so they're struggling with their identity. And what we know is that something happened to them. And so um, and, and, and if I can interject this right now in my testimony, in, in the movie— if the viewers look closely, Stephen Black, Denise, Laura, and myself, all, all four of us, talk about being sexually abused mm. in the movie. Our testimony mm. is about the sexual abuse that caused them to either identify as a gay man or a lesbian woman or lesbian man, lesbian who identified as a man, Denise Mm -hmm. said in her testimony how she struggled after her dad uh, did some inappropriate things with her. She struggled with Mm -hmm. whether maybe I should have been a boy. So, uh, And then I talk about my own story in there about how what sexual abuse did to me, like I'm talking about it today. So I think there's the Mm -hmm. common thread to people identifying as gay or lesbian, transgender, or struggling with their identity is, in many cases, sexual abuse. And at least in these four cases in the movie, that's exactly what it is. So, um, and you, and, and you're referring my... to the in his, I'm sorry, you're referring to the yes. in his image film, and and I know right. you know this better than probably mo- most of us uh, listening to you. Uh, that those who advocate for you know the LGBTQIP plus you know uh, s- political agenda would would bristle at the notion that sexual abuse is connected to a lot of the transgender ideology and even uh, the homosexual or the lesbian identifications. Yeah. Well, of course, they're, they're going to bristle at it uh, because it's true. The, the, the truth always makes them bristle. And mm. the truth is very uncomfortable, uh, but the truth remains the truth. And, and if you listen... Mm. To the movie and his image, you'll see these these real truths emerge in each testimony. And so, mm. in in my life, you know, I was married and went through you know uh, these great jobs. And then, like so many people do, if you struggle long enough, you you you're trying to find some um, some way to work through it. So I went to one of the gender specialists, which there weren't many in in 1981. Uh, by this time, you know, I'm obviously 31. Let's see, how old was I? 40, whatever I was at that. You know, I'm in my, my late 30s, uh, and I start taking um, on this idea that I needed to have a therapist to help me deal with this. And so the therapist said, well, you have a gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria, and the treatment for that is hormones and surgery. But you need to be on hormones for two years. So, um, you know, I thought, okay, I I want to get rid of this because I'm dealing with this, and I've been dealing with it all my life. I I want it to go away. So I opted for taking the hormones and in 1983 underwent the reassignment surgery after divorcing my wife um, of 16 years and um, leaving my family um, and having this new identity of, of Laura Jensen. So... Uh, at that point, I lost my job. I became homeless. 
um, I was living in a park uh, in Long Beach, California, as an alcoholic. Um, so, you know, the, again, the consequences, uh, if we can go back and, and look at the purple dress and the abuse by Uncle Fred, we're now looking at the, the real life consequences of not having anyone along the way who has the ability to identify what happened to me. Nobody's really mm. telling me what happened. The, the gender specialist, who, by the way, uh, was Dr. Paul Walker, was actually one of the very original authors of the International Standards of Care for the Treatment of Gender Dysphoria. And and it's turned into WPATH now, the, the standard. He actually wrote it. He was the world-renowned person in how to diagnose and treat this disorder, and he got it wrong. I mean, he mm. got it wrong. I, I didn't mm. need hormone therapy, and I certainly didn't need surgery. I needed someone to help me deal with the emotional and psychological and sexual abuse caused by my grandmother and my uncle. And those things oftentimes uh, are never considered when a person goes in and presents themselves as struggling or wanting to be or identify as transgender. Uh, and, and so they just sort of pass over that and say, sure, you can have the hormones, you can have the surgery, let's go. Um, but there's Why always, do you think that is? Well, because if they did that, no one would have hormones and surgery because they would discover, just as I do, 100% of the time with the people I work with, I spend time with them, we have been able to identify exactly what caused them to not want to be who they are. And, and so, if, again, if we go back to in his image, we can, we can see this happening in the movie. You know, Stephen Black talks about his uh, being inappropriately dealt with sexually on two occasions. And Denise talks about it, and, and Laura talks about it, I talk about it. So if, if they actually were to inject real therapeutic um, reviews of people's life, their history, they would find out that they were sexually abused or they were emotionally abused, they were psychologically abused. Uh, they don't want to be who they are for some reason. And they would find out that hormones and surgery are absolutely never necessary. There isn't one let person. Me in, let, me inter let me interrupt briefly right there. We'll pick up right at this point on the other side of the break. You're listening to Walt Heyer here on the Hamilton Corner. You don't want to remiss, miss the remainder of this interview. Like no other nation, Americans have lived under the blessing of prosperity and liberty. These gifts are part of the heritage of a country grounded in the truths of Scripture and given by God to advance the gospel at home and abroad. In these days of moral and spiritual confusion, maintaining the freedom to express our faith in the public square has never been more important. The American Family Association, working to preserve religious liberty for generations to come. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and one-minute commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. My guest is my dear brother in the Lord, Walt Heyer, who underwent gender reassignment surgery in 1983, who lived for eight years as a transgender woman and then detransitioned as the Lord saved him. He was able to identify the source of trauma that caused him to question his identity in the first place. And since then, he has committed himself to helping other people who are struggling in this area. He is one of the featured people in American Family Studios' upcoming film, In His Image. And before we went to the break, uh, while we were right at the point where I had previously asked the question, uh, why won't these mental health professionals and behavioral health professionals spend more time attempting to identify uh, the trauma and the abuse that people who suffer from who, who may suffer from gender dysphoria have undergone instead of immediately rushing in with the suggestion of hormones and uh, really mutilation of their bodies. Because because the truth is. 
sex reassignment surgery does not change a person's sex, right? No, that's exactly right. But the, but the, the real answer here is that it would, if they were to dig in and do some good, sound, effective questioning, uh, they would discover that these individuals don't need hormones and they don't need surgical procedures. They don't need a, a new pronoun. They don't need a new name. They just need someone to work through the issues that caused them to want to identify as someone else. And there's, I have found in the people that I work with over the last 10 years that each one of them has been able to identify that particular issue. It isn't always mm-hmm. sexual abuse. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's emotional, psychological, and other other abuses. But there's trauma. There's abuse. There's a, a deep dislike for who they are for some reason. And if we spend mm-hmm. enough time addressing it, we can help them. It, it, they're, so the therapists don't want to discover these things. That's the bottom line. They don't want to know what caused All they want to do is they're advocates. And they build their reputation on the number of people they can give hormones to and and surgical procedures. That's the way they make their money. And the old story, follow the money. Uh, Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. I get them on the other side because my website, sexchangeregret.com, people have regret. They contact me and like me, they detransition as well. So they don't Mm -hmm. really want to know what caused them to feel this way. That's not important. The only thing they want to do is if they feel like they want to change, they want to affirm them, give them hormones, and provide surgical procedures. And that, that sounds to me like a compounding of abuse. People come oh. because of trauma and pain and abuse and end up uh, having trusted themselves to medical professionals, behavioral professionals, mental health professionals who then compound that abuse. Well, that's exactly right because – you know, you, you see the, the again, the consequences. It's a word people don't use very much. Consequences are that they end up contacting me. I, I had someone contact me just three or four days ago who the only reason he went in and asked for hormones and surgery, he didn't have gender dysphoria. He didn't really want to be transgender. But he told me, I asked him, why did you want to do this? He says, well, I'm gay. And I didn't want to be called a faggot. I'd rather be called a transgender. So I decided to undergo the change. Mm. That's all it was. But but the point that I'm trying to make here is that they will give that person hormones and surgically change his body, even though the only reason that he wanted the hormones and surgery is because he didn't want to be called a fag. He didn't have gender dysphoria. He wasn't a transgender. Mm. And so this is what we see. What, what we don't seem to understand, and it's not talked about enough, is that many of the men that I work with, uh, as I said earlier, they're, they're married, they have children. They're not transgender at all. Um, they're suffering from conditions that most people never heard of. I work with them and help them identify these conditions in their terms like autogynephilia transvestic mm. fetish disorder, uh, mm. transvestism, cross-dressers. And, and the, the real, these are the heterosexual component of people who identify or want to identify in a different gender that, are, that don't have same-sex attraction. The, the homosexual component of the cross-dressers are typically something everybody's familiar with, and that's called drag queens. And for Mm. the most part, the drag queen population, they don't actually have uh, what we call bottom surgery. They just have hormones and they are very flamboyant. They're they're more of female impersonator, but they will identify as transgender, same as the person who's struggling with autogynephilia or some other disorder. Many of the men, like myself, who were married and had children, were suffering from a, like a dissociative disorder or bipolar mm-hmm. disorder, maybe even body dysmorphia or separation mm-hmm. anxiety, depression, and all these other real, real disorders that no one ever takes the time to address or treat 
when they walk into a gender clinic and say, I'm struggling. And so uh, these are individuals that know exactly what men and women are. They're not really confused about uh, what a man is to do or a woman is to do or their position in life. They were sexually abused or emotionally abused. And this is the consequences of trying to cope with what happened to them. I, I can tell you uh, a couple of, uh, more than a couple. Uh, one person I talked to uh, when he said he was in his 40s, and he says, I don't really know why I, I did what I did. Because I asked him, why'd you do it? And he said, I don't know why. And I said, well, let's go back and talk about your early life. And so as we crawled through his early life, he said, well, one summer I was at swimming camp and the diving coach sexually molested me. Uh, and so I said, well, how soon after that sexual molestation uh, by the diving coach did you then want to identify uh, as a transgender? He stopped for a minute and he goes, oh, my gosh, right after that. Mm -hmm. And then we, we began to deal with uh, his feelings and what had happened. And the truth was he didn't really want to be a transgender. He didn't want to be a female. And so the question that you would ask is then, why did you go through the surgery? He told me that he had his genitals removed as a defense mechanism against ever being sexually abused again. He wanted, he did not want to be a target for any mm -hmm. further sexual abuse. So again, he didn't have gender dysphoria. My he wasn't a transgender. He was doing the surgery because he did not want to be a target of sexual sure. abuse mm. and now so you, these are the things that we see yeah now you detransitioned more than 25 years ago and after having the gender reassignment surgery sex reassignment surgery and we've used that term would you for those who may not be familiar with it would you one uh dis, dis, define what detransitioning is and then talk to the listeners about your website sexchangeregret.com and how you got started in that work sure well detransitioning means you, you've come to realize that the hormones and surgery did not fix you and did not resolve the deeper issues. And so what, what do I do with knowing that it didn't fix me? And so detransitioning means that you begin to uh, go back and maybe you have th as many surgeries, reversal surgeries as you possibly can. You obviously go back and change your birth record. If that was changed, you change your driver's license and medical records. And you begin to identify in the way that God actually made you. And, uh, you know, what we know is that at conception, uh, your gender and sex are, are wedded together and cannot ever be changed by hormones or surgery. And so we go back and, and realize that we were misled. Um, and, and so we have to reclaim our life again. And that's what it says on the website. I want my life back. And that's what sex change regret is about. So I help the people work through therapy if they need it, uh, finding a proper church, um, and just going back and telling their family or their ex-wife by this time or their children, that they made a mistake just as I had to do. Mm. Now, I know, and the listeners may not know, I know that in the course of your journey uh, that Jesus Christ saved your soul. Would you tell the listeners a little bit about how uh, you came to Christ through this process of detransitioning? Yeah, well, I was fortunate that I went to a church that had um, a Ph.D. Christian therapist on staff, I went to another church in another area that also had a Ph.D. psychologist. And between the two doctors in two different locations, I was going to therapy on a very frequent basis. And um, I was blessed that the church was funding the therapist so that, because I didn't have the money. And so over a period of time, we began to identify the uh, same way I help people today. Uh, what caused them to come to this uh, wrong conclusion and, and bad choice. And and so once we identify that, we start to use prayer. And this is the, this is the thing that makes me smile. I mean, there's nothing 
more powerful than admitting that you're wrong, mm, come getting on. down on your knees and telling the Lord, I need you, mm. and then praying for redemption and restoration. And that's what I did. And the Lord came and embraced me, redeemed me in 1990. And um, so you can see that it's been 30 years. So um, I've been redeemed and restored and and I'm back now. I'm married now for 23 years to a wonderful, real God-made woman. She's beautiful. Uh, she's very bright. Um, and so uh, we have this ministry where we work with uh, people around the world. It's one of the largest ministries of its kind in terms of working individually with people. There are others that do the same. Uh, we started ours about 10 years ago, and uh, we're very excited uh, to have written seven books, published seven books, and um, and work with people around the world. So um, we are exactly where the Lord wants us to be, uh, standing up for, for the truth and helping people find the life that was lost uh, by uh, the, the ideology that you can change. And as you pointed out early in this show, uh, no one, has that actually ever medically, hormonally, surgically, or scientifically ever changed their gender? It doesn't happen. It's not possible. Now, your testimony is in our day and age, many people may be listening now and thinking, man, I've never heard a testimony like this. Um, it seems that the people who are proponents of this ideology work feverishly to keep testimonies like yours from being brought to mainstream attention. Uh, why, why do you think that's the case? Well, we go back to the same reason that the therapists or the people in the gender clinics don't want to look for what the underlying causes, we call them comorbidities. Nobody wants to know what caused them to feel like they needed hormones and surgery. That's still relevant. When I began to talk about these issues and then talk about the fact that you can detransition. These are the two things that they don't want anybody to know about, that you, that you didn't change. They lied to you about that, and they misrepresented the fact that you're going to be happy. And, um, and we can see in the movie, in his image, uh, the people reclaimed their life, Stephen, mm -hmm. uh, Laura, and myself. And um, Denise struggled a little bit with her identity, but she finally settled on who God made her to be. So those are the things that they don't want you to know. And um, those are the things I get so much joy and pleasure out of sharing with people because when we do that and people listen intently and watch the movie very closely in his image, they will see that they don't need hormones. They don't need surgical procedures. They need to look at what's causing them to feel like they're not in the right body. And it could be body dysmorphia, it could be bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, it could be some sexual dysfunction disorder, it could be a, a whole load of things, but about 50% of the people that I work with is purely sexual abuse as a child or early sexualization, pornography, things like this that were introduced to them that confused them about who they were. So. Um, you're right. The, the LGBT are proponents of it's okay to show kids pornography. It's okay for them to identify as a different gender. Uh, and so we're battling some pretty heavy-duty evil here with the truth. And uh, that's the side of the line I want to stand on. Amen. Folks, the movie is In His Image. You can go to inhisimage.movie for more information concerning the film. Walt Hires Ministry is Sex Change Regret. His website is sexchangeregret.com. If you or someone you know may be struggling in this area, please go to his website. He will meet you with grace, but also with truth. If you're struggling, there is hope for you. And just as he found redemption at the cross, the cross is still available to you. God bless you. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio.